I think um, we do have a quorum now and it is seven o'clock. So um, I'll let a, wait for a bit to let some more advisory members roll in, but uh, I think we should call the meeting to order. Um, so can I get a motion to uh, open the meeting? So moved. Second. Great, uh, let's vote. Uh, Mark? Aye. Peter? Aye. Dan? Aye. Wasim? Aye. Brendan? Aye. Jane? Aye. And I'm also an aye. Uh, so the meeting is called to order at 7.01 p.m. This is the Sherburne Advisory Committee uh, public meeting of Wednesday, March 9th. Um, first off, uh, would any of the advisory members care to volunteer to take minutes? I can do it. Thanks, you, Brendan. Um, all right, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. And I know um, Steve Leahy is not going to be able to join us. Um, all right, so I will begin by <clears throat> reading the agenda. Um, so first off, are there any uh, items, uh, uh, sorry, first item, addition of topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. Does anybody have any items that they wanna add? All right, uh, hearing none. Um, we then will do uh, liaison reports uh, and then we will be continuing our discussions of the annual town meeting warrant articles for um, 2022. Um, on the agenda today, we have article 21, Sherburne advise uh, affordable housing trust by law. Uh, article 22, floodplain district. Article 23, the Sherburne community center lease. Article 24, wireless communications lease for the Sherburne community center. Article 25, wireless communications lease, 212 Lake Street. Article 26, uh, wireless communications lease, 114 Hunting Lane. Article 27, Verizon easement for Village Way slash Leland Drive. Uh, Article 28, Verizon easement for 4 Sanger Street, Sherburn Library. Article 29, release right, title, and interest in uh, and to a portion of Obed Lane. Article 31, citizens petition, amend ZBL section 4.5, open space subdivision bylaw. Uh, then after that, we will go over the previous uh, meeting minutes. Uh, and Natalie Weir is uh, joining the meeting now. Um, does anybody have any uh, comments or concerns about the agenda? All right, uh, hearing none then, I think um, let's, Move on to the first item, which is liaison reports. Uh, do any of the advisory members have any liaison reports? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Just a um, brief update on uh, ARPA project. So I uh, was at a meeting this week with um, Deb Seifring, Diane Moores, and the consultant whom the select board has hired to help with a process for uh, thinking about ARPA projects. So I think. Uh, from department heads and various other groups in town. I think a list of possible signature projects is gonna get put together. I think the consultant's gonna pull that together uh, with an eye towards a discussion, I think at the March 24th select board meeting. So two weeks from tomorrow. And I think we'll need to just make sure that the board is mindful of uh, advisory wanting a chance to uh, consider and assess all these things as well as uh, select board considering and assessing all of these things. Great, thank you. Uh, any other liaison reports? Um, I actually have one item. Um, I spoke with um, the fire chief Zach Ward today um, it was in regards to one of the um, uh, capital items that he has uh, presented to us. Actually, he's presented to everybody already, the um, utility terrain vehicle. So you may remember that the intention was to um, purchase that using the uh, balance of the um, surplus vehicle 
or suppress equipment um, revolving fund. Um, as such, that revolving fund is um, is managed by the select board and the use of funds basically only requires the select board to um, uh, allow it basically. Um, so given that um, I believe that there has been not official votes, but I think tacit approval by advisory select board and um, the capital budget committee um, for the purchase of that vehicle and uh, with the intention of using the um, revolving fund to purchase it rather than using free cash or um, debt. Um, I believe that they would like to pull that item off of the warrant um, so that the, essentially the select board can um, approve it um, at either their next meeting or the meeting after that. Um, so I wanted to bring that to the attention of advisory and see if anybody had any questions, comments, or concerns about that. I'm sorry, which revolving fund was that? The surplus equipment uh, revolving fund. Thank you. And I believe it was the, the sale of the fire command vehicle, you know, netted something on the order of $32,000, which is the, um, conveniently is the amount of uh, the utility terrain vehicle that they want to purchase. Um, all right, so, uh, Given that the, there's no, no objections to that, I will let um, Chief Ward and um, the Select Board know that, uh, that they sort of have our go ahead to, um, to just take that off of the warrant. So Steve, just a quick um, question. Uh, yeah. So the, the way that, so normally citizens would vote on something like this because it's borrowing, <laughs> right? Normal, yeah, well, normally, citizens would vote on something like this because it is a capital item. Um, so even, <clears throat> even for the free cash capital items, the citizens typically would vote for them as well. Okay, so the way, now that this is not an article, the way citizens would vote on it is essentially approving or not approving the budget. Is that correct or, or, or how? What is there? Is there going to be a line item that someone from Sherburne can say hold? on this line item? Uh, uh, no, no, uh, it'll be off of the warrant. Yeah, can I interject just a little bit? Um, yes, I don't know ahead. if you remember um, last, last meeting when we um, approved the spending limits of the revolving funds. This is actually a chapter 44, section 53 and a half revolving fund, which means we authorize the spending limits in that fund. So last week when we went through that, there that list of revolving funds included the surplus um, equipment thing, and we approved that they could spend up to $65,000 out of that revolving fund. So in essence, you know, you're not approving that exact vehicle, but you are, when you approve the revolving funds, you are approving that that money can be spent towards whatever is deemed appropriate. And when that revolving fund was set up, it it stated that it had to be approved by the select board. So the select board can approve that spending. Thank, thank you. Steve, okay, Steve if I can add, yep. if I can yep. add a little uh, texture and context. Um, this was a big charge of mine last year when they turned in the command vehicle, which had residual value, which was significant. I wanted to offset debt, but because of the financing, we had to do it piecemeal, buy the new command vehicle and then sell the old one, which was a prudent uh, fiscal decision because we got more on the auction than we would in a trade. -in. And so the cash was dumped into this revolving fund and I, at, uh, it was last March where I questioned that and Paul Dorensis read through the articles and said, no, the um, select board has, the, as elected officials, has approval process over those funds. And to me, you know, I was the biggest advocate of like fiscal conservancy, making sure that the um, 
cash in value of the old was used appropriately for the fire department. And this works out well because um, they're getting equipment that they need based upon a value that was not applied to debt, but is applied to future spending. So um, it did work and um, I, I support this. Great, thank you, Peter. Deb, Deb can you remind us, did we uh, decide last week on a revolving fund limit for that fund for the, the FY23? Yeah. Uh, our tentative number was 65,000 because that's the balance of monies that they have in there at this current period of time. But there, there won't be 65,000 when this uh, vehicle is purchased, right? Does that no. matter? No, 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 it, it doesn't matter because during the course of the year, you assume that we'll be selling other things. And you know, as the name implies, it's a revolving fund. So money will come in and go out and come in and go out. Okay, I mean, well, theme does raise a good issue because when this fund was set up, one of the concerns was, well, does this take uh, the right to say yay or nay on the purchase of these, you know, this equipment from the citizens? And I think Peter, you had rightly pointed out that one way to deal with that would be to make sure that the limits on spending on the revolving fund were, you know, um, uh, appropriate so that you know things couldn't get out of hand. So I just that that I just a reminder. Thank you, Wasim, for the reminder on that discussion that we had, and. Thank you, Peter, for your suggestion about keeping an eye on the revolving fund limits, spending limits. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that the fire, the fire department good, did a very nice job of being very transparent. And, you know, maybe that could be the directive to both the uh, police chief and the DPW guys, you know, just to make it at least transparent to you as the advisory board that, you know, if there's an, any spending over, you know, a certain dollar limit, let's say $10,000, that you would like to be involved in it, you know, just as a courtesy. I mean, that's your choice. And, and if I can interject, um, Zach did come to me with this and uh, we talked about it extensively and his business acumen to auction versus trade-in created value to the, sh um, not shareholders, but uh, taxpayers. Uh, was the right move. And now it, in, in, um, it was confirmed that the select board can authorize, and we give them the ability to authorize a certain level of uh, leeway to use these funds. That value for the trade-in is now benefit to the fire department. And um, it was, yes, open, notorious, and very um, well advertised. And so I think the town is benefiting from this. Thanks, Sean, do you have your hand up? I do, and I, I wanna point out that uh, exactly a year ago, we were having this discussion. This was so transparent. I said, the reason we upped the limit and we had some pretty lengthy discussions was because of the sale. I wasn't involved in the tail end of it after the sale. I still think that money should have gone into the, to the repayment, but it didn't for whatever reason, I wasn't involved in that. But just so everyone knows, the reason we haven't given Deb an, a, a number for this coming year, because she's asked, is because I didn't, I wasn't quite sure until about five minutes ago, whether or not the the cash was going to come out of the revolving fund before or after town meeting, but better yet, before or after July 1st um, for the UTV, because it makes a difference, right? If, if, if that cash has to hold over and then get spent basically on July 2nd, then we need, a, we need the limit still at the level it was at. Because if, you know, if we were to drop the limit to 40, and we pull 35 out day one, then then there's no limit left. Um, if this gets approved and the select board's going to act and the money's going to going to be out of the, that fund before July 2nd, um, which is yet to be seen, then we probably don't need the limit as high. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So is the uh, revolving fund limit for the current fiscal year high enough to accommodate the purchase of this uh, UTV? 
Yeah, yes, it's at 50,000. Yeah. It's at 50,000, okay. Um, all right, and so I guess if, if we know prior to the public hearing, um, or I, I guess the last minute would be, I mean, I'd rather not, I, I would rather not um, have an amendment or to anything after the public hearing. So if we would know by March 26th, whether that purchase is gonna happen before July 1st, um, then we could actually reduce the spending limit on that revolving fund, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, great. All right, so let's just keep that in mind and we'll just make sure that we are on top of that at the public hearing when we um, actually list out the numbers for the revolving funds. We'll just have to make sure we know whether or not that UTV is, is being purchased. And, and Steve, I've, I've heard from um, Chief Ward and uh, others that the revolving fund is segregated by department so that the funds that the, and Sean, you may back me up on this, um, that the fire department contributes to that revolving fund, the funds that the DPW contributes to that revolving fund, the funds that the police department contribute, contribute to those revolving funds are segregated so that we can keep track of that which is a benefit to everyone. Well, yeah, I believe they are, but for the, for the purpose of your committee, they're not, it's one limit. Yeah. It's a single, it's a single trip limit for per year. So. Uh, and then um, I, although I brought this topic up, I'm also gonna shut it down now because this is, it's a liaison report. And I think the broader discussion of that revolving fund is well outside, I think of the, uh, the liaison report, which was just, um, we're, we're planning on using it to purchase the UTV and that was supposed to be the end of it. Um, so Steve, does that mean I can't ask a quick question? Uh, is it about the UTV or is it about the revolving fund in general? It's actually about the revolving fund. Uh, can we can we table it unless unless you think that it has an effect on whether or not this UTV gets purchased out of the revolving fund? Again, this is not an agenda item. We're not talking about the revolving fund. That's fine, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so let us go on to the warrant article discussions then, and we're gonna take these uh, essentially in the order uh, on the agenda, which is the order they are in the uh, in town, uh, the uh, warrant. So first is article 21, uh, Sherburne Affordable Housing Trust by law. And I believe Addie Mae Weiss, you're here. I am. So it's pretty straightforward. I, hopefully this won't take but a few minutes, just that we, when we went around, um, went about last year working on um, creating, let's say we, I guess this past fall when we got the um, members appointed to the housing trust, and then we started working on the declaration of trust. We made some language, we realized that there were some language changes um, that needed to be changed in the general bylaw, referring to there was a line um, in section 4.1 about investments and allowed for using prudent investor standards. And at the time we were working on the declaration of trust, we learned that that was a mistake on our part, that the um, prudent investor standards are not allowed for muni municipal trusts. So we took the language, we don't have that language in our declaration of trust, and therefore we need to amend the um, section 4.1 of chapter 31 of the Sherburne Affordable Housing General Bylaw to be in compliance um, and just change the language so that it's the same so we would remove the line using prudent investor standards and replace that with taking account of safety, liquidity and yield. All officers who control the investment of such funds shall invest them in accordance with Mass General Laws, chapter 44, section 54. All right, sorry, I'm uh, shuffling up your windows here. I don't, uh, do you by any chance have Wait, I've got the, uh, I have the warrant here. 
the the warrant language does it have the before and after in it right now it does right it should um, all right let me let me share I, my I submitted, screen i submitted both the current and the updated this is just two small paragraphs um let's see this one right yeah that's it all right yep so this is it okay yeah okay so so currently it says so the underlying part is the part that's being changed is that right correct so instead of using prudent investor standards which apparently is not legal for municipal trust you're replacing it with taking account of safety liquidity and yield all officers who control the investment of such funds shall invest them in accordance with mgl chapter 44 section 54. correct and presumably this is essentially the the language that you need for a municipal municipal trust. And was was this, um, this was passed by, by town council? By yes. town council. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, does anybody from advisory have any questions about this? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Uh, thanks. This all seems very straightforward. Just interested. Did you have any flexibility or choice as to what investment standard the municipal trust would use, or this is the one that municipal trusts are required to use? Uh, I mean, this is pretty much the language. I'm trying to remember if this was actually verbatim in Mass General Laws, Chapter 44, but okay. I, it was, it's pretty standard. I know it was supplied to us by town council. Okay, no, that, that's great. I'm, I'm not trying to, I, I'm yeah. just trying to make sure I got the, the, the backstory here. That's great, thanks. Great, anyone else from advisory have any questions or comments about this article? I think you want right. to put um, in the first paragraph at the top, where it says replacing them with the words taking account of safety, liquidity, and right. yield. I think you want to put that in quotes. Sorry, Brendan. Can you repeat that? I was, I was temporarily distracted. <laughs> Sorry, it, it, it's you know, ultimately it's up to town council, but. Uh, in the, in the middle of the first paragraph, uh, after section four, powers of trustees and replacing them with the words, that should be quotes, with the words, quote, taking account of safety, liquidity, and yield, end quote. Yeah, that makes sense, Brandon, just for, um, yeah, moving oh, okay. to you're making sure both areas, you know, the old language is in quotes, so therefore the new language should also be in quote in that paragraph, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so you're, yeah, you're missing a quote right there. Um, all right. I don't know. Um, let's see. Are you guys that, able to edit this or should I be no, bring that to Jeannie's no. attention? Yeah, bring it to bring it to Jeannie and Diane because uh yeah. so the only the select board can uh open the warrant and make changes and close it again. And I'm I'm hoping that they're going to finalize the warrant tomorrow. So okay. um, or you can just forget I said it and nobody else will probably notice. <laughs> Somebody will notice. <laughs> You're not the only lawyer in this town. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if possible, Addy, can you yeah. can you just bring that to the attention of Jeannie and Diane, and and yeah. uh, ho hopefully tomorrow they can make that change at the meeting at, at the select board meeting. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Last call for questions or comments on Article Twenty One. All right, great. I think that's it. Thank you, Addy. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, all right, next up, Article 22, floodplain district. Um, let's see, uh, both Chris Owen and Gino are here. If you have something that you wanted to um, screen share, I can give you that control, or if you want me to just have the uh, warrant article up, uh, I can do that too, whatever's, what, whatever's easier for you. Um, Gino? Um, I do have a couple of you know, brief slides if you'd like to oh, see great. those. Yes, please. Okay.
if I can find that file. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Okay, so the, the bottom line really is, uh, well, just to give some history, this, uh, this article, this bylaw was first adopted in 1970, adopt, uh, updated a couple of times. 2010 and 2014, they were mostly map updates at that time. Uh, but the bottom line is we're required to have this in order to qualify for FEMA flood insurance. Uh, so this, all this does is incorporates language that's required by FEMA into our existing bylaw. We pretty much had most of, uh, of this in place and I would characterize the changes as relatively minor. Um, and again, failure to comply results in losing flood pet. There's no financial impact on the town and um, that, that's it as far as my slides. I'll start sharing. But uh, to give you a flavor of the type of changes, the purpose section, there's a list of six items that FEMA asked to be included. We previously just said the purpose was to, you know, protect public uh, health and safety. There are 16 definitions that FEMA wants added. We have to follow those definitions anyway, or if the flood insurance program does. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it, it just, provides information to include them in the bylaw. And then some of the other changes, for example, there's a, a requirement to say something about recreation vehicles. If they're in the floodplain must be elevated or remain um, road worthy so it can be driven out. Uh, there's a requirement for um, if variances are granted either by the ZBA or the state building standards that the, uh, the applicant is notified that it could have an impact on their premiums. Uh, there's uh, most of the things, as I said, of the 20 items we already had in. Another one, for example, uh, if there's a structure in the floodplain, there must be drainage paths provided to go around the structures. Uh, it's, it's that level of, of changes that are, that are in here. So nothing earth shattering, nothing, nothing that um, um, uh, is no map changes. So whoever's in the floodplain now is still in the floodplain. There's nobody added, nobody taken out. And um, the bottom line again is if we want to stay in the flood insurance program, make that available to Sherman residents, we, we need to make these changes. And that's it. Um, Great. Gina, I had a, um, a request and a question. Um, the request is um, if, if you could provide the, uh, a red line version of this so that we can actually see, you know, what the changes are. I tried to go through it, but it's, it's a little hard to parse without a red line. So, um, if you could provide that to, to, to advisory, that would be great. Sure, um, no problem. Are, are any of the wording changes, um, or maybe a better way to ask the question is, are all of the wording changes required by FEMA or are there some others that we decided to do as well? No, they're all directly from the, um, the, 20, the list of 20 items that the state provided that through FEMA. There's okay, so, you know, what would be really helpful if you, when you provide the red, I have the write up on this, so I just want, if you, oh. when you provide the red line, if you could um, also, whatever background document there is from FEMA that explains why changes have to be made and what changes have to be made, that would be helpful as well. If you could okay, that. yes, I do have that. Thank you. And these, the new FEMA regulations, are they as of 2022? 2020. Uh, yeah, they 2020. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, all right. Any any other questions or comments about the floodplain? Uh, Daryl. I'm just curious. Is this not done at the state level because either not all towns have floodplains and or not all towns want to participate in FEMA? No, um, the, the state is responsible for, uh, I believe, overseeing and implementing these. The, there's a state agency that oversees flood, um, flood protection and, and, and flood insurance program. So that's why it goes through the state. Oh, I just meant why. It seems like a lot to add to each town's uh, regulations, this kind of detail. But that's why I was wondering if it just doesn't apply to everybody, every town. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, they want they want it in, in the local, in the local oh. regulations. Okay. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Um, all right, last call for questions or comments for Gino about the floodplain district. All right, so none, I think we're done with that one. Thank you, Gino. All right, next, uh, I believe these next several are all Sean's. Um, so we have article 23, Sherborne Community Center lease. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, we're gonna go through these quick. It's snowing. Um, so the community center lease, which I don't know if, our, if most people are aware, that has existed for over for 20 years. We're in the last term of that lease. We extended it for a year. Um, town meeting has to give the approval for any uh, d disposition of any any real estate. So town meeting needs to give approval. We don't have another lease that's gonna go out. The select board's gonna be tasked with putting an RFP together and, and putting that out. Whether or not any changes will be made is up for discussion later. But during this year, they need to do that. And town meeting needs to give approval and authority for the select board to act on that. So that's the first. That plays into the second one. So, uh, so before we leave the first, can I just ask a question about that one in particular? Yeah, and I wasn't trying to skip it. I was just trying to combine the two, but go ahead. Um, well, because uh, my question is only relevant to this first one. Um, it, it says at least for up to 20 years. And my only question about that is that, um, I know the Council on Aging is, it, you know, they're in a study right now. And at one point, there had been some discussion about whether potentially the community center at some point might be used in part or in whole, or, you know, I don't know, for, for some sort of senior activity. And so I'm wondering, um, is 20 years an appropriate authorization at this point, given that that's still an inactive study, you know, with recommendations to be provided on what to do about a senior center or lack thereof or you know whatever it may be so again that plays into my almost last comment of there's a lot of discussions to be had during the rfp process 20 year is basically the maximum um i think legal limit that the that would not take an act of the legislature um anything beyond that would would probably be a, le a little out of hand but Certainly, those are discussions that should be had, and I, I, this committee probably should be involved in those discussions. But that's after town meeting. That really, we need to just have a clean vote on whether or not the town has the authority to do it. If we don't, then we're going to go out of lease. The building will be there. Someone will, you know, people will be using it, and there won't be a legal lease. So it's important to just stay focused on giving the authority to do it. And certainly the select board should involve many parties on, on how that takes place and, and who's involved in that lease or who's, you know, how the wording of the RFP is. It has to go out as a public RFP. 
Um, but, uh, but that's... Yeah, and I, I get that authority needs to be granted to enter into a new lease, but my question is just, should the authority be granted to do a 20 year lease or you know, maybe should the citizens have the option of, should that be limited to say a one or a two or a three year lease so that there could be flexibility if we were to get a report you know, with respect to, to, to the outstanding consulting that's being done right now that might want, you know, we might want to reconsider and then it would be too late if, if the select board had already gone into a 20 year lease. It says up to 20 years, right? Right, but this gives them the unilateral authority to decide they're just going to do a 20 year lease. And I'm wondering if that's really, you know, under the circumstances, if, if that's, you know, the right thing for the citizens to be asked to vote on or whether it should be one or perhaps one or two or three years. I, I realize, you know, that's not what's in the warrant right now, but if you said it might get finalized tomorrow night. So I just want to raise this issue, you know, to see if there's any possibility of limiting that so that we'd have more flexibility potentially. That's, that's really an interesting question. Um, and I, one, I can assure you the warrant's not getting, the, I, I don't, believe the warrant's getting open and closed tomorrow night. Um, I think it's getting open and closed on the 24th. There's supposed to be discussion of it tomorrow night. Maybe Diane wants to weigh in on that, but that, that is an interesting um, question it, that, that we may want to limit it. I, I urge that we, we definitely want to get through town meeting and have a clean vote um, to support it. So we don't end up in some weird where we point where we, we're in limbo and no one can act on it. Um, so, but certainly limiting the years back to 10 or five, I, I don't know that five is really, I mean, you, this lease does play into, currently plays into how the building is actually managed and maintained. Um, but again, that's up for discussion and that's up for the town to decide if that's how they want to continue. But we don't want to, we don't want to tangle that up with the town meeting discussion. Um, because if, if we move nowhere with it, then, then no one's gonna maintain it for the next year. Well, I guess another way to look at it is if there are citizens who are concerned about, you know, who, they, who think that that is an appropriate use for a potential senior center at some point, I wouldn't want the opposite to happen where it doesn't pass because it gives the select board, you know, the right to enter into a 20 year lease. And people don't necessarily wanna do that. If it's limited, you know, we don't really have to worry about it. We're giving the select board the authority they need to do a lease because they have to do a lease now, but we're not opening up the possibility that, you know, people are going to get concerned that it's too long or, you know. I guess personally, I, I would prefer that this be limited to, you know, no more than five years, maybe even three. And I think that's an, e you know, a much easier vote for the citizens. And I think it gives us the opportunity to take into account whatever may come out of this consulting study that we're paying good money for. You know, I mean, if the consulting study said, yes, you need a senior center and the community center would be a great place to put it. And now, you know, we've just <laughs> entered into a 20 year lease and we can't do that. That would be a waste of that money that we spent on the consulting study, right? So. I can't say I disagree with any of that. Um, and I, and I, I think that's probably a good discussion for the next couple of meetings, right? Um, although we don't want to be changing the warrant um, after the fact that, uh, you know, if this isn't figured out before your hearing, it should be figured out of your hearing, I think, right? I'll certainly yeah. bring it up at the select board. Tomorrow yeah, if you night. can do that, Sean, that would be great. I mean, I'll. <laughs> I'll be at the meeting tomorrow, and then I, I try to be at every select board meeting. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think if we can try to bring this up, especially at whatever meeting they decide to open and close the warrant and finalize it, I think uh -huh. this would be an item that we would want to say, hey, can we take another look at this? Right. And tomorrow night might be the opportunity to try to set that in motion um, so that it's a, it's a little less of a discussion on the 24th. Because if they open and close on the 24th, we you, you don't want to add too much of the discussion on that same night. Right. Let's right. try to discuss it tomorrow night. Okay. I think there's a standing uh, agenda item for discussion of the warrant, right? On, in the meeting. So right. we can just bring it up. Okay. I think the next right. few are, I think the next few are a little bit easier. Okay. Um, and if I can inject um, the standard, uh, at least not standard, but the common practice on the, private side is when um, uh, leases come up and there's 
indecision on what to do, it's a one year lease. You just go year to year and then um, you're able to decide the next year. So uh, five sounds like an, a long year. One year is usually what happens and you decide because a lot can change in real estate in one year. So. I'll and again, I, I, we are limiting the, you know, the, the high end of it. Um, and, and the, you know, the select board could certainly put out a one-year lease um, as part of the RFP. And, and, and they could urge that. They, I mean, they really could do anything they want under it. We're limiting the, the, the outside end of that um, with a town meeting article because they need the authority. They have no authority um, without a vote. But I, I agree with having the, the conversation up front on, on what the upset limit should be anyway, because 20 years does seem like a long time. I mean, honestly, right. 20 years seems like a long time, even if we didn't have this other outstanding issue. Right. Let's move to the next three articles where 20 years is not a long time. Um, can Before you do that, um, uh, a, uh, we have a Barbara Ambos who has uh, her hand up. I, I was just going to ask whether there's going to be public comments on, on these articles, because <laughs> there are some members of the board of directors of the community center present, and I feel uncomfortable speaking for them. I just would like to say that in terms of our business model, where we rent the facility for events, that's our major source of income, that, um, we can't do bookings for one year. We need a little bit, a little bit deeper thing. People plan weddings years in advance, and um, just so that you're aware of our business model. Okay, if, thanks. It's yeah, point. it's uh, just so you know this. Uh, this meeting is it's not a public hearing, so I don't kind of like open up public comments like anybody oh, can okay. raise. Well, there seemed to be one the last the last article so yeah um uh but just so you know at the public hearing on the 26th um uh you know we will discuss all of these articles and it goes through the all of the standard public hearing um, procedures including public comment and everything so um there'll be multiple opportunities to discuss um, all right, Sean, continue on with your, and uh, the oh, wireless communications no. lease, that's just wrapped up in with article 23, right? Because you're just essentially the same thing goes between article 23 and 24. Is that right? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. My, I can. my screen went blank. My computer went blank. Well, um, I can still I can still see you and hear you. Oh, now I'm back. Now one screen went blank. So, uh, for those that don't know, the um, there's a cell tower in the cupola of the community center. Can you still hear me? Because everyone's bouncing around my screen. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Currently, there's a master lease, which is what we basically just talked about, and under that master lease is a sublease that allowed um, the Community Center Foundation under the master lease to lease out the space in the attic um, for a Verizon cell tower. That is being now separated out. Uh, it's it's deemed that legally we need to do that under, under the town's 30B and, and it needs to go out for RFP, much like any other cell tower. Uh, so that's where we created Article 24, uh, so that once once given the authority, the select board can put out that um, an RFP for that for that cell tower. The typical term is usually 20 years uh, for a cell tower. We're going to talk about that for the next two as well. Uh, anything under 10 is considered not a long term 
and makes the cell tower company, the cell companies pretty nervous. So it, it's typical that you'd, you'd be at 20 years. Um, it's highly likely that Verizon's going to be the, continue to be the carrier up there. They have all their infrastructure up there that they'd have to yank out if they weren't. Uh, but it's, it's going to term out with the master lease, which is terming out this year anyway. So we have to do this to ensure that we continue to have that, uh, that tower up there and the income from it. My so humble opinion that, from looking at, oh, sorry, Steve, my humble opinion uh, from looking at the other leases um, for cell towers a few years back is how do we maximize a lease? And if it is a long term and we have competitive bids, uh, then the revenue would benefit the taxpayers. Sorry, Steve. Uh, yeah, so my question was just, so so the length of the lease in Article 24 is then not necessarily tied to the length of the lease in Article 23? It will not be, correct. Okay. And it can be longer than the length of the lease in Article 23? Correct. That was okay. not possible before. And that's one of the reasons why that, you know, that that wouldn't go forward continuing when it was because a master lease terms out and the sublease has to term out with it. Okay. All right, that makes sense. Um, do you want to do articles at 25 and 26? I presume. Yeah, they're... we can keep going. So 25. Uh, can I, I'm sorry to do this. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I just, um, I, I think this is again, just if they're going to reopen the warrant, I, I think there's some wording problems here. Is, should it maybe say to enter into a contract with a wireless communication provider? Or, and does it need to say, you know, develop, have an RFP process and enter into a contract? I mean, I, when I, just reading this, it's, it's a little hard to tell even what's going on, just the way it's worded. Well, we edited, but didn't re-release the warrant. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. So it, it says enter into a with, and that's supposed to, that first sentence is supposed to say lease, just like the first sentence in the other two and the next two articles. Okay. Okay. Reads. Does okay. that answer your question? I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. Thank we you. caught it. We caught it the other day, but didn't, there were several other changes that probably need to happen with the warrant anyway. So we didn't, we didn't re-release that. But. Uh, and to so, your point. I, and I don't know if there's uh, room up there, but maybe we try not to sign exclusive leases if we could get multiple carriers up there. Um, that, that's not actually how that one would go. Um, and again, we're not dictating the process by giving, we're giving the authority to the select board to sign the lease. Right. Town meeting has to give the authority to the select board to sign the lease. The RFP is not, this is not the RFP. Sure, lease or leases, so it's not exclusive. Sure, but that won't apply in this building. We can't have multiple carriers in this building. Okay. And I can address that on the next two slightly different. Um, 212 Lake Street, Article 25, that's the newest tower that we built. Um, some members right, might remember how many years it took um, to, to clear all the hurdles to get that up. That tower is on town forest as is the hunting lane one. Um, that's, I think it's just at 10 years of a 20 year lease. They, I think you guys will remember that uh, American Tower brought forth a, a couple different options to buy out the lease, to buy the property, to buy a permanent easement, um, all of which we rejected. But it, it is advantageous for them and us to, to be at the, you know, closer to the 20 year mark than the 10 year mark. Once again, once they get under 10 years, they, they have trouble um, subleasing out the extra space on the tower. So financially it's advantageous to put that back out on RFP um, to, to basically re-up that, that lease. So it's, it, it, it'll restart at the 20 year term rather than going to eight, nine, 10 years. So again, town meeting needs to approve it so that the select board can put it out on RFP 
and, and basically it's the current leasee that's asked us to do that. So there's no, there's no real downside to doing it. We want it, we need that tower to function. And if we get a second carrier on it, I believe we, we make more money anyway. Uh, the same goes for Sean, Sean, do we have more I'm sorry um, do we have more leverage if we shorten the lease uh, especially when someone doesn't want a shortened lease and wants a long lease understood you you amortize the costs over 20 years versus 10 but does that provide the um, towns folks and, and administration more leverage in the negotiations no, it's counter to that. We, it, it, it's very advantageous to have a long-term lease. Um, they are, from what I'm told, it's it's almost impossible to get a sublease. In other words, a diff, another carrier on that tower if they're under ten years, um, because they, you know, that second carrier has a lot of infrastructure they have to build out. So if they if if they can't sign a long-term lease, then then they're really not going to be able to sell it out. So it's it's in our best interest to have that um, to what they consider long term, which is well over ten years. But we have the um, geographic advantage because, as townspeople know, there was no salt service in that part of town, at least for the town forest, or I forget which one, um, for many years, and now there is, and so I'm I'm just testing the assumptions of the economic model. Um, not that we want to prohibit the select board from making the best deal, but providing the best advantage to the taxpayers on those towers, which, um, you know, we, we, we fought valiantly not to put it in the high school and, um, there are now more in town, which we all benefit from. Uh, and so, you know, I'm trying to maximize value. That's all I'm trying to do. I, I don't know how better to explain it. Right now, there's a 10 year lease. If we put it out for RFP and it comes in lower, we can stay on the 10 year lease. We can just reject all the bids. Um, but it, it, I don't, I don't see how that. There's any advantage? Yeah, because Peter, what, what 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 is it that you're saying would be maximizing the benefit to the taxpayers? Is that we have the option of going ten or twenty years, and and maybe I'm misunderstanding um, the article, um, but if we had the ability to go short or long. Here, I, I, I'll explain it in physical terms. There's a tower up there that could handle our radio communication, which they have to allow us to do, which we have up there, and at least two carriers. There's one carrier up there. There's always going to be one carrier if we don't extend the lease because a second carrier will not buy onto that tower on a short-term basis. That's what they're telling us, and that's what you know history has proven us so if we want to maximize the profit on that we need to we need to put it back out on a 20-year term and we have a shot at getting a second carrier if we wait 10 or 15 years to find out maybe 5g plummets you know peppers the town and and nobody needs our cell towers anymore and we lose all the revenue i don't know i don't know what's going to happen so that's helpful sean thank you A slightly different story is Article 26. The Hunting Lane Tower is just about at the end of its term. Um, so we have to put that one out. There's, it, there's not really an option. Um, that houses both our repeater and all our base radio equipment. Um, there's currently, there was two carriers, but due to the merger, with T-Mobile, there's, there's theoretically only one carrier. We want that out on a long term. Um, being that I live on the north side of town, I'm hoping Verizon would be enticed to be up there. Um, and that would, we currently, the way the lease is written, we profit share off the second carrier. 
um, we get a base rate and then and then a, a cut of the second carrier if they get a second carrier. So we stand to make more money if we get a second one. Whether or not the lease will be as profitable now as it was during the next tell era when the, when the, the first lease was signed, I don't know. That's yet to be seen, but we we need to put that back out. And the only way for the select board to do that is is with this article. Uh, so, is there a reason why it still just says to be to be determined in terms of the the up to how many years? Yeah, it seems like mostly you're saying twenty years is the way to go. I think they're both going to be twenty. That's also going to be um, determined, I think, by council before. Uh, they open and close the warrant. Okay. I think the max is going to be 20. So both of these will also need a um, an act of the legislature again. These are both on town forest. So the chapter 97 restricted land, the state legislature needs a dual act to be able to, to allow us to um, have this use of the land. But this vote will allow the select board to petition that. All right, any advisory member questions or comments about any of these uh, wireless communications leases? All right, uh, hearing none. Um, Sean, do you wanna move on to the Verizon easements, articles 27 and 28? The, so Village Way, um, has never had Verizon Fios service in it. They it, were really displeased with Comcast. So I helped them and we pushed Verizon to uh, to put the infrastructure in to get Fios in there. It's a little bit of work because all the, all the infrastructure there is underground. Um, one of the things you have to do when, when Verizon runs new underground lines is you have to give them an easement for wherever their infrastructure is going to be. Really just to ensure that they're not going to spend a bunch of capital money putting it in and you're just going to rip it up because you want to move a road, you want to move a building, you don't want it anymore. Uh, so that's all that's for. There's the easement language. I'm not sure if you guys have it and also a map. Um, it, it's somewhat of a rough map because it just shows how they're going to get to the three buildings. The easements, just so you know, for the for the communications, usually share the same space, uh, not necessarily the same conduit, but it's sometimes the same trench as Eversource and or Comcast. Uh, so it, do it doesn't restrict the use of the land other than the infrastructure that's pretty much already there. Um, there's obviously already Verizon lines there, but those are the old copper lines from when it was originally built. So that's that's due to be abandoned anyway. Anyone that's using copper right now from Verizon, it's going to be abandoned. And it was supposed to be this year, but COVID pushed it out probably another year. Um, so if you're going to stay with Verizon, you have to go to Fios anyway. On private property, they don't ask for this, but on, on public and commercial property, they need an easement. The second one is, is basically the same thing. We ran Fios into the library. Um, there's a conduit that goes under Sanger Street, which I installed, and then a conduit that goes all the way into the building. And they just ask for an easement um, where those conduits are, just to ensure that their infrastructure is not going to be ripped out when we decide to move things. <clears throat> John, can, can you help me understand? I, maybe it's just a different situation, but what you know, with, with other utilities in town, we actually make a lot of money off, um, you know, their equipment being on our property. And so why, I, it's not clear to me why in this case, we would want to give a free permanent easement to a particular provider. It, it just seems like that would not only limit us from not, you know, potentially giving that um, easement to another provider at some point. I mean, if we decide we don't like Verizon, we've given them the easement. Well, no, who else can come in at that point? And, you know, what if, 
even if the current business model or economic model is not that we get paid for these kinds of things. I mean, how do we know that's not going to change in the future? And, and there isn't tax money to be made on, you know, that they have to pay for their having their equipment there. So I, I'm not sure why this is necessarily advantageous. So it, it, it's not whether it's advantageous. The, the major distinction there you're missing is when they're paying us for their equipment, that's, that's for their transmission equipment. They're asking for an easement to bring service to our building. We ask them, please bring your service to our building. So they're investing infrastructure to bring us the service that we're paying for. We, do you understand? This isn't their infrastructure so they can transmit to all the residents of Sherburne or, or you know, a pipeline through so they can get to Holliston. This is so that the Fios that we asked them to bring to our library can be brought to our library. Well, yeah, but it's a business proposition for them too. I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is just because today we think it would be great to have Verizon in there because we don't like Comcast, you know, that doesn't mean that 10 years from now, we wouldn't much rather have a different provider or, you know, and then if you've granted a permanent easement to one, it may be difficult to, you know, you're, you're, you're potentially cutting off options. And so I'm not sure why we essentially have to pay them in, in a way because, you know, an easement is worth something in theory, right? It should be worth something. Why, why are we paying them you know, to come and get business, additional business in Sherburne. You may say, well, they don't necessarily want to be here right now. Okay, I get that. But still, you know, this is a permanent thing we're doing. And I don't know, uh, that makes me nervous because I'm not sure that there isn't another solution that we'd rather have at some point in the future that we're now precluded from having. Now, I, maybe you misunderstood it. Right next to the Verizon pipe that Verizon's going to spend their own capital to put in is yeah. a Comcast pipe that Comcast paid money to put in. So Verizon is asking for an easement so that they don't spend $100,000 adding pipes and, and trenches and handholes and infrastructure and fiber optic cable to our um, property and then have us turn around and go, you know what, why don't you rip all that out? We're asking them to build out an infrastructure. It's not precluding anyone else. They're going to install their infrastructure, their conduits, their pipes, and they're just asking for an easement that we can't make them rip it out next year. Does Comcast currently have an easement? Comcast is already there. Do they have an easement? I don't believe we gave them an easement. I don't think they asked for one. They should have. And they well, certainly can. Um, if they were building it out new, they probably should, but that's Verizon does do that. And Eversource would. We don't normally run into this because it's normally on the right of way of the street. And so we don't, we wouldn't normally bring that to town meeting um, because it just falls under the street permits, et cetera. But this is where it leaves the right of way of the street and goes through a piece of property. I'm skeptical if Comcast doesn't need an easement, why Verizon does. I mean, I get that they asked for it. But you know they're not fools at Comcast either, right? So well, Comcast put their stuff in in early, the early '90s, so nobody was asking for easements in the early '90s. There's a big difference. I don't know why. What that would, would happen, Sean, theoretically, if the town voted no? They're not going to install files at the Woodhaven, and the library, the select board already. Uh, no, I take that back. The select board already signed a, a temporary um, um, use easement for the period yeah, I of, thought... of until the town. The town's not going to vote now. I, <laughs> it's just, it's not really an option. Yeah, I'm, just, really an option. I'm just wondering what, what would happen, you know, because my, my understanding, for, at least from the select board meeting where, where you discuss this with them, is that I thought that the work had already been done because they had granted a temporary easement and we were just converting a temporary easement to a permanent one. Right. The work isn't done yet. I was trying okay. to keep the work moving. If you'd like to find out if Verizon would pull out of going to Woodhaven, you can call all the Woodhaven residents and let them know why Fios didn't get installed. They're not going to do it if the town's even questioning whether we want to give them an easement. 
So they aren't they aren't actually doing the work under the temporary easement. They're if the town voted down the easement, Verizon's not going to install the prop. The, the, I can tell you they're not going to. It's it's probably between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars worth of infrastructure they're doing. It would be very embarrassing for the town to do something like that to Verizon. Do we have data on whether for other providers, other towns, you know, whether this is a common practice to grant the easements? Do other towns do this? I mean, you know, it would be helpful if 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 this is just you know standard operating procedure in other towns right now, that, that would help me personally to understand this better than than if we just, you know, right now it just sounds like Verizon asked for permanent easement and we said, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, it's very <laughs> common. <uncomfortable. laughs> it's very common. I don't know. I don't I don't know how to get data. I mean, you can call five other towns and ask them if you give if they give permanent easements on public property if you want. Well, <laughs> You know, I, I don't think it's the job of advisory to, to, to conduct surveys of, of other towns. I would think that, you know, when this is something like this is being brought to the residents to vote on and to advisory to opine on that we would have some data to that effect. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable request. Um, do you, Jane, would you want us to ask the select board and or the um, interim town administrator to contact some other towns to find out if this is standard practice? That'd be great. I mean, you know, whoever the right the right entity is to, to make those inquiries would be great, but I, I think we should have that data. I, I, I just feel uncomfortable saying sure grant the permanent easement when we if we don't even know whether that's common you know standard operating procedure uh diane do you have your hand up uh yes yeah, steve the office will look into it tomorrow all right thank you um one question sean uh in both articles there's another to be determined it says grant a permanent utility easement to verizon for two to be determined what is the to d to be determined yeah, I don't know. That's going to go away. Okay. So what will what will the language? Yeah, there, say? there is no. There's not a period of up to. That was a mistake. Right, because like it's Wait. it's a permanent. <laughs> yeah, it, it's permanent. Okay. So it'll just be permanent utility easement to Verizon at Village Way, Leland Drive, and and then at Sanger Street. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments uh, about the Verizon easements? Uh, all right, can we go on to Article 29, the uh, release right title and interest, interest in and to a portion of Obed Lane? Steve? I'm awfully sorry to interrupt, I'm, I, but I just had another thought about that last one. You know, I, that might even be something, Diane, if we could even ask town council about that, whether it's, you know, whether it's a, in, in their experience that that is something that is typically done. You know, that's, it's illegal, you know, we'd be granting a legal right. So I think to ask town council whether that is an appropriate action to take would, would, would. So town, town council has been involved in it the whole time. Um. I'll, do you have the language of the easements? Jane? I'm sorry. Do, do, you uh, have, do you have the language of the easements anywhere? I don't believe no, so. I don't have all we have is, looking at the warrant. Yeah, all what's we that? have is what's in the warrant. Yeah, no, that's not the language of the easements. I'm not going to bother sharing it. It's too boring. Um, I can forward that. And. No, um, I, I don't want any language from easements because, I mean, a permanent easement is a permanent easement. I don't really care what the language is. It, it's just, uh, maybe, so, maybe we just need to know whether it's standard operating procedure or not. I mean, if, if they have a permanent easement, we can never tell them, get your, you know, it's, it works the other way, right? We can't ever tell them, get your lines out of there. We need to rebuild or we need to do this or, you know, whatever it may be. I mean, that's that's significant. What so do you I want me to do? Sure. Should Amanda be here? I'm, I'm Should legal counsel be here? 
Well, they, I think an opinion as to whether it's a good idea to do something like that would be helpful. Do you think I brought it here without an opinion from legal counsel? I don't know, Sean. I mean, you didn't tell us that you had an opinion from legal counsel. If you say you do, when they said, yes, great idea, you should do this. Okay. All right. Well, well, let's start over. Everything, I went over everything here with legal counsel. So before I presented it to the advisory board. If you'd like, we can have, she's going to be here at the hearing. I, I don't know what more you want me to do. We can have her do a finding, but obviously an easement that what I would bring to town meeting would come from legal counsel. She reviews all of these before they'd go to the select board, before they'd go to town meeting. You think I just made this up? No, 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 Sean, not at all. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that, I, I, but but my concern is not with the wording of the easement because I'm sure that council would review wording of an easement, but my, my concern is more you know, whether grant, whether the, it's prudent to grant the easement in the first place, whether it's necessary. I understand. So what would make you more comfortable? Obviously, I don't. So what would make you more comfortable with that? This isn't anything personal to you, Sean. I'm not suggesting you've done anything. I, I know, but what do you want me to get from may, may, legal May I interject? May I interject here just from a, a business perspective? And I know the T's and C's have to be crossed. But if Comcast now delivers their great services that they advertise maybe they don't um and we disadvantage them with a permanent easement from verizon then the competitive landscape for fiber optics has changed in the town where comcast is now it is a disadvantage because Yes, 20 years ago, because they were the sole provider, uh, or maybe double provider, uh, they didn't ask for an easement, but Verizon did because that's the climate today. Are, are we altering the competitiveness for internet service so that, you know, it's going to cost taxpayers more in the long run? Well, the, you know, that's for the select board to determine on each one of them have a license to operate cable TV in the town. That's not part of this discussion. This is a single piece of property that we have asked Verizon to bring service in, and they're going to spend a significant amount of money to do it. And we asked them to do that. And it's standard for them to ask for a right of easement so that their infrastructure right. so will why, get why destroyed don't, just because we a naive question, a, a naive question, Sean. I have two cables that come in my house, one yeah. for Comcast, which I didn't don't use one for Verizon, which I asked for them to bring in. And they said, well, we leave the other cable there in case you change your mind. Right. And and so that's that's residential, which is very different. It's very different. But now when you turn to I know it's very different. And now when you turn to the current town properties where. I, I think disadvantaging the current provider who has a cable already in there, which we don't want, and advantaging someone that we do want forever. Well, we're not removing Comcast wire. We're not touching Comcast. And also, conduit. I think, Sean, you mentioned that this the, the easement doesn't exclude um, other easements in the future, right? Right, it's, and it, it, it's it not replacing Comcast. Ease, but... They're both going to have the opportunity to sell there. Comcast has their infrastructure there. Verizon needs to upgrade theirs to get theirs in. There is no Verizon cable TV or internet service at Woodhaven. So we're, we're allowing the opportunity and asking for Verizon to take the opportunity to add service there. And by the way, Verizon has to do this because they're upgrading all copper to fire to fiber anyway so at some point they were going to have to do this so that they can provide telephone service which they've always provided obviously um on new age cable rather than copper cable which is being phased out and then theoretically 10 15 years from now if some unnamed telecom company uh decides that they want to get whatever is the newfangled technology then into um, Village Way and the library, this easement in no way excludes or precludes their ability to do that, right? It, it does not. 
Thank you. Um, all right, I've got three people with hands up, um, Addie Mae, and then Jeannie, and then Diane. I mean, I just, the big difference here is Village Way is a private road. It's not a town public road. So that's why, you know, everyone else in town who has Comcast option or Fios option, they, the, the infrastructure is under the road, the, the, the public road. But Village Way, if you go to the Register of Deeds, it's a private way. And that's why this all was begun to begin with back a couple months ago with Town Council. Daddy me, I don't understand that. If it's a private way, why does the town need to grant a permanent easement? Because it's owned by the town, but it's not recorded as a public road. It's, it's, it's town land. It's like the town campus, I guess. It, I don't know, it's just the way it was recorded. It's, it's a Middlesex Registry of Deeds, book 1999, page 115. Thanks. Jeannie? Um, I just wanted to say that this isn't an unusual thing. The selectmen have granted um, easements for Verizon, for Eversource, for NSTAR before it was Eversource. They've done it at different, uh, under different streets in town. So this isn't something that's new and it hasn't changed whether people use Comcast for their phones or Verizon for their phones. It's just in order to bring wires and um, and conduit under roads or along the side of the roads to different telephone poles in order to provide service to, to different houses or whatever. It's been going on for a while. So it's, this isn't anything new. I just didn't want you to think this was something that Sean was, you know, just bringing forward for the first time. But we will call tomorrow and we'll ask other towns. But again, the selecting of approving um, easements for a long time for Verizon and for Eversort. And are they always permanent easements? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Diane? Uh, yes, yeah, Steve. Uh, when we were working with town council on the language, if there was a problem with it, and they didn't think it was a good idea for the town, they would have advised us on that. And they did not. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, all right, any other questions or comments from anybody about the Verizon easements? All right, let's move on to Article 29, the Obed Lane. I might actually share a screen if you want. Has, uh, it, yeah, has anyone, yeah. unless you guys have these maps? We don't. All right, you wanna let me share? Uh, yeah, you should have the ability to already. Mm -hmm. All right, I got two different ones I'm gonna share. Can you, sorry, whoa, can you see that? I see, it says Sean Colleen has started screen sharing, but I don't actually see your screen. Really? Yeah, it's, can anyone else actually, oh, that, there it is, there it is. I was slow. <clears throat> Are you looking at a plan with Ovid Lane up the middle of it? Yep. Okay, so this is a plan of the land, and it roughly should, where it says Ovid Lane is the easement. It comes, let me scroll down a little bit. I'm hoping you see the same thing I see. So you see Lake Street going across the bottom of the screen? Yes. Um, what, what doesn't show there, I don't know how many people know the area, but if you were to keep going down the bottom of the screen, Ovid Lane actually exists. Um, as a dirt road, there's one driveway on it, and then it actually 
comes out behind the highway garage and on, on Butler Street. This section doesn't exist. It's just, it's someone's yard. Um, so there's an easement that does not, it starts at Lake Street, does not go to another boundary on their property. Um, and I want to try to change. I'm hoping when I change this, it changes what you see. Did that change what you see? Yes. It did? All right. Yes. So now you're looking at a map with several properties, right? All right, so you can see th this map doesn't show the easement, but you can picture, you saw that dog leg, the lot looks like a pork chop. Yep. It, it's obvious that someone, there was a cart path there from from what I've been told there was a cart path there. You can tell if, if before Morse Road was subdivided or even built, maybe that easement went somewhere, but it's completely surrounded by private property. It, it can't lead anywhere. It can't lead to another trail. The Price Woodlands is the big piece of property that kind of horseshoes around everything. You can't get there. Um, you really can't go anywhere. You can get to the back door of Jeannie Guthrie's house, maybe, if you want to. Uh, <laughs> but again, you got to you got to walk in her private property. So it's a useless easement. It 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 may have made sense at one point before they develop Morse Road, but uh, once they subdivide, it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, we can't use it. We can't use it for a trail, but it does inhibit the use of their land. Uh, I'll go back to it. I hope I go to the right one. Uh, because if you were looking at it, it's basically, I think it's their driveway and the access to one of their garages. So w we have no use for it, no use for it. Um, but it, it, it hinders their, their use of their land. So we really, we should release it. it, it we have no value. And it's an easement, it doesn't hold any value. We can't transfer it to anyone else. And to be clear, this is an easement, right? It isn't town owned land. Correct. And, and many of these questions came up during the select board uh, meeting. There's no, there's no value that we could sell it for. And, and obviously the town is not currently using it for any purpose at all. No. How, how long have we had this easement for? Um, it was recorded in, looks like November 2nd of 1960, I think. Okay. That may not be the actual date. Jeannie, do you know when this was recorded as an easement? This is the easement, right? That is the easement. Um, it was, re I don't know the exact date. I know it was done before Morse Road was subdivided. It used to be owned by one person and it was a cart path for people to go back um, into the woods behind, but now it's all subdivided. It's all private property. It's, it's basically useless to the town, but having it on the property of my neighbor makes it difficult for her to do anything with her property. So she has, she's the one, her lawyer has, is the one who put this forward and it has to go in front of town meeting. Great. Uh, Dan, you've got your hand up. Just what, what does the easement allow the town to do? Nothing. I mean, is it access like the town? I mean, obviously this would never happen, but the town could put a road there or nope. could put Verizon, Verizon Fios lines there or- Nope, <laughs> nothing. It, it's an that, well, yeah, it's not defined what we would do with it. I mean, if it was a stormwater easement, we wanted to convey stormwater there, that would have been part of that easement plan. <laughs> it's obviously so, not. That's not what we'd use okay. it for. So, so uh, I, I mean- it, so an easement was put in place some decades ago for some reason then, but there's nothing written down that, you know, it allows the town to do X, Y, and Z. It's just, there's an easement, but doesn't really do anything. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You can uh, see, 
you can actually see there's a line across. It doesn't even go to the end of her property. It goes across. Um, it goes across at where the just before the leg goes out. So the easement isn't that entire kind of. No. Uh, it's no. Yeah, okay. And that's why, I, you know, although it was a cart path, I, I have the feeling they may have considered before they built Morse Road, maybe they thought they were going to build Morse Road as a loop. Mm. Because if you look at the at the two properties together, the way they subdivided them, uh, forget the cul-de-sac because that was built later. But if the last you house on the left wasn't there, maybe it was going to be a loop. Yeah. But it, that didn't happen. So now it's totally landlocked by private property and it's, it's better to just release it. Does okay. um, anyone know whether the easement is taxable property or is it not? I, she pay, I'm assuming they're like taxable by who? Like the town. She she owns the land, so she's presumably paying tax on it, right? Yes, she owns the, it's her property, and she pays the taxes on it. So it doesn't. It, if the easement goes away, she's still paying taxes. If the easement stays, she's still paying taxes. She might get a reduction right now. I don't know. The assessors may look at that and not tax that square footage. I don't. I have no idea. Well, there's value. All, all I'm asking is, there a value of that land? Because when you bought the land, you have your property lawyers look and see what easements there are, and you purchase uh, the, the value of the land. And if we change it, the, the value changes. And if the property tax went up because there's more land to tax, then that value is transferred from the public to the private. And the uh, tax revenue offsets that value change. That's that's all I'm trying to determine. I feel like I could probably buy a snowplow for that. We can retax that. We'll reassess it. No, Sean, you'd float dead for that snowplow. I know you would. Make sure it's an electric snowplow. Yes, of course. Uh, Jane, you have a, your hand up. Yeah, my, my question, I think, is, is somewhat similar to Peter's. I'm just curious. Maybe it's another question as to whether we've talked to town council at all about what, what is customary in these situations. You know, do you, is there typically some kind of a financial transaction for giving up an easement, or is it just, you know, standard I, in a situation like this to just say, sure, go ahead? You know, I, I just want to make sure we're not, it's the same idea as Peter's question, really. Um, town council wrote the language. Um, she and when I talked to Amanda, because one of the selectmen had a question on whether it was a fee or an easement, and she said it is an easement that can just be released by the town. Thank you. I think the outstanding question is be, would be if this uh, if that square footage of land is is being taxed at the normal rate. I don't think that would change anyone's vote though. If anything, our tax bill's going up, right? It's not going to go down. Right, right. The, the, the value, um, the value right. of that land, the value of that easement, if the town has no more value in easing that land, if that's a verb, noun, or whatever, um, then yes, is a benefit uh, because they're paying taxes maybe at a lower rate or the same rate. Uh, if they're paying taxes on the whole thing, then it, to me, it's it's the reasonable thing to do because we have no design on that from right. the current knowledge base and that they should have full ownership of their property. Right. And I was trying to look that up, but I keep screwing my screen share up when I do it. So we can um, we can ask Wendy to look at that and have that answer. Yeah, it would be interesting to know that. Although, again, I don't believe that it will affect the vote. Right. I think all it would do is identify a miss on uh, on a rebate that they could have had. Yeah. All right. Any other 
questions or comments about Obed Lane? All right. If not, I think we're done with that one. Thank you, Sean, for thank you for all thank of you. the articles you just presented. Um, all right. Next, we have Article Thirty One: Citizens Petition Amend the ZBL Section Four Point Five Open Space Subdivision Bylaw. And I believe uh, Rebecca Honeywell, you're here. Yes. Hi. Good evening. Hello. Uh, thank you. I wanted to. Um, go over the two changes that are proposed to the um, open face subdivision bylaw. And these are designed to have to create similar protections and standards for Sherburne's subdivisions as those that would exist in other towns in Massachusetts. Um, at the same time, it would allow us to comply with the drinking water laws, 310 CMR 22, and environmental impact reporting laws um, specifically uh, the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act, um, which just was um, enacted in January of this year, 3, 301 CMR 11. Um, if we do this, it will help hopefully to avoid unintended consequences in a subdivision um, under this bylaw where we can't meet the local setback requirements for the Board of Health or um, some of the wetlands uh, setbacks. I have a presentation that I have put together and I just wasn't sure what format you had in mind for tonight. You can screen share if you, yeah, you can screen share. Okay, so I'll try to be. Of course I just. Bear with me, sorry. It's all right. Okay, let's see if this works. Is this filling your screen? I'm trying to get it. Uh, it's not, oh, yep, there. And if you, you, can, you should be able to go into presentation mode. If you, in the toolbar at the bottom, yeah, that, yeah. Wait, you were just hovering over it. Oh, there we are. Yes. Okay. I couldn't see it. It was literally right in front of me. Okay. Can you ready? You have it? Yep. So this is the Warren article is a citizen's petition. There are 22 signatures, and we're hoping uh, that the um, two small amendments might be made to the open space subdivision bylaw as written. These two changes um, to the open space subdivision bylaw are proposed and they will allow Sherburne's drinking water standards to comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act within a subdivision, um, as well as environmental assessment consistent with the Environmental Policy Act 301 CMR 11, um, which requires pre-construction um, it involves environmental health impact analysis and reporting in the pre-construction phase um, of a subdivision or anything with multi-unit uh, development projects of all sorts. Why is Sherburn? Why is this um, something that we would consider in Sherburn? Well, we, as you, I'm sure know, have 100% private water supplies and in the form of wells in our residence. And although the wells are private for um, the schools and the restaurants and the businesses, these are considered to be uh, public water supplies at the state level. So they're regulated um, and um, by the DEP. At the residential level, however, there's no state or federal protection of private water supplies. As you know, the geology also leads to a 60% surface of wetlands, which increases risk of contamination across property lines when we can't meet setback requirements. And the Sherburn uh, Board of Health regulations, as well as the wetland setbacks, which are required under Conservation Commission federal laws for cons you know, protection of wetlands, et cetera, they cannot be met in a subdivision. Um, although in 98% of towns in Massachusetts, 
um, citizens and abutters are protected prior to construction projects in order to anticipate concerns, ensure safe planning, obviate risks, and protect public health. So if these two changes are implemented, it would protect our drinking water, it would protect our property values, it would be, have there be benefits to the environment and the shared natural resources. So that could be, range from land to aquifers. And obviously this would lead to uh, potential um, diminishing risks of litigation. Um, the effect of these two changes would be that we would, in a subdivision, where we can't meet the local setback requirements of our regulations, it would allow the same standards that apply to similar projects in most towns. Um, this would improve the protections when private, when shared drinking water supplies and sources are shared. Um, and this obviously would decrease liability for the town as well. So, Drinking water protection that most people take for granted is going to be applied here in the permitting process. Um, we know that in a subdivision, there the cluster zoning leads to increased demands of the natural resources, as well as creating increased output into um, septic systems or directly into the ground. And that also has considerations that need to be uh, con uh, evaluated. So it, by doing these um, evaluations prior to permitting, it allows the boards to give input and for safer and more maybe practical um, systems to be developed that would be appropriate for an individual project on an individual particular lot. Um, subdivision cluster zone private water supplies would have these protections that are existing already under 310 CMR 22 in other towns. We just don't have them because our water supplies are private. Um, the environmental health impact reporting is required in 90%, 98% of towns um, as part of pre-construction evaluation. And we've already seen this in Sherburn in the, in the larger projects such as the 40B projects because those are regulated at the state level as a public water supply under the current laws. Um, but in our subdivisions, it's possible that they may not meet the thresholds that are um, considered would necessarily precipitate state um, evaluation and regulation. So this would allow us to improve designs when necessary. It would not wait until after the fact, at which point abutters and residents have to suffer the consequences. And it obviously will also be beneficial, be beneficial for the builders and the contractors who, you know, it just increases costs and causes delays when changes need to be made. Um, so this may also have a benefit for decreasing litigation for the town. Clearly this would, de this would improve um, public health protections and certainly would prevent unintended consequences. Um, I, of course, keep saying this, so I apologize for being redundant, but I think we need to not underestimate the um, benefit of avoiding unnecessary conflicts and litigation for the town. So in conclusion, um, we are hoping that two small changes to the wording of the open space bylaw with pertaining to um, pre-construction evaluation, environmental health impact reporting, and protection of drinking water in subdivisions will um, enhance the benefits of this um, bylaw for the town while decreasing costs overall. Um, the next slide is just sort of a summary in case people have questions, but I think I've pretty much addressed all those issues. So that's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you. Um, so I guess first I have some uh, questions and comments, I guess. I have some 
broad overarching questions and then mm -hmm. potentially some small nitty gritty ones. Uh, and I'm hoping that perhaps your answer to some of the broader ones may um, they make the, the nitty gritty ones moot. Uh, but, but my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have not actually brought this um, officially to the planning board, is that right? Right, but that right. is but absolutely that is planned. Absolutely. We just had, it was precipitated by a, a couple um, cases that came before the Board of Health in the last couple years and some concerns of residents. And basically, they, we realized that we were very close to the deadline for the um, warrant deadline. So we decided to just put it on the warrant and we're hoping to formally discuss it. I was gonna bring it to the Board of Health, to the Planning Board and to the Select Board for commentary, because obviously we don't need to, we can always withdraw it from the warrant if necessary. But um, we did seek legal counsel and also have been consulting with the um, attorney at the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, which is the entity that av advises boards of health. Um, and the real challenge is because Sherburn has um, shared resources and many times projects will be just below the threshold of where the state will regulate. It's much simpler when the state regulates it for us, but it's there are some challenges that um, are presented when the boards are um, unable to lean on state uh, guidance for uh, to enforce local and state regulations. Um, okay, I so. So this and is where subdivisions it gets a have the, these risks are only um, they're specifically applying to a subdivision where we can't meet the local regulations. Okay, I, so here's my here's my my overarching question and or concern and 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 ultimately my hope that you will actually choose to withdraw this, which is that the the, the normal process by which we would be um, uh, creating or amending or revising um, regulatory bylaws would be that the regulatory board, which has the authority, would be the ones that bring it up. And it, it could very well be that um, a citizen or a member of a, another board brings it to their attention, and then they would discuss it. And I've attended enough planning board and board of health meetings to know that the discussion would be very thorough and lengthy. It would probably um, cover many hours over many months worth of meetings. And then they would have a public hearing where there would be a lot of public comment. And throughout all of this time, there would be a lot of changes to the entire thing. And then ultimately once they decided that it was ready for prime time and it was what the public was ready to support, then, then the regulatory board would bring it to town meeting. Um, and that's, that, that process has not been followed here. And so then regardless of the merits of your, your proposal, I guess my, my, my knee jerk reaction is no, 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 you should probably go through the appropriate process. And, oh, we, um, and, and we have actually a comment from um, Chris Owen, the planning board um, that, that, that more or less is, is of the same opinion. And I think that uh, you know, I think that the position of the planning board would be, why, why can you please bring this to the attention of the planning board and we will discuss it and we would be happy to um, bring this to town meeting next year um, after having had all of that, that broad discussion. Um, one of the issues being, of course, that um, if this were to be brought to town meeting and you, because it's a citizen's petition, this is another quote unquote drawback to a citizen's petition, you cannot change a single word or a single punctuation in this um, uh, Warren article. You have to bring it to town meeting as is. So even if you were to bring this to the Board of Health and to the planning board and to the select board between now and town meeting, you couldn't actually make any changes to it. Um, and then because it's a zoning bylaw, it has to pass by a two thirds majority, which is a very high bar 
And oftentimes, even after the many months and sometimes years worth of discussion and altering, the planning board still struggles to get their zoning bylaws passed with a two thirds majority. I, mean, I think that I feel that given that the process hasn't been followed, the likelihood that this is going to pass town meeting this year would be extremely, extremely slim. And um, once a zoning change has been uh, voted down by town meeting, I believe there's a two year moratorium such that you cannot bring it back to town meeting for another two years. So, so, it, so it actually hamstrings your ability to get a well-crafted um, revision passed in a timely manner. Um, I, I think it would be actually to your benefit to, to withdraw it and to bring it to the, the, the planning board and, and have all the discussions um, that you mentioned um, as opposed to doing it this way. So that's, that's my broad sort of commentary on, on this. And I, I, I welcome your response to that. So the, the planning board has spent a lot of time on this um, bylaw and they asked for our input on the board of health and it wasn't until about eight weeks ago unfortunately that we identified a challenge due to a current case um, that exposed a potential unintended consequence or maybe an omission um, I don't know how you'd say it, but we definitely, as a board of health, gave some suggestions to the uh, planning board and we were involved and we did have a lot of discussions. But this particular issue, which maybe was, um, I think it really was and was not intended. And I think the consequence has been exposed um, through a recent um, challenge that the Board of Health is addressing right now. And I think that if we are able to amend the bylaw, it will, we're not changing the bylaw. This is encouraging um, cluster zoning. It will allow the cluster zones to be safer because at the current moment, our Board of Health regulations do not um, apply to cluster zoning. And the consequence is that the future residents, as well as the abutters, are forced to sue because the, the Department of Environmental Protection considers anything that involves um, drinking water and or um, these issues that I've raised have to are um, a private, a civil matter between two property owners. And what happens is, I mean, we already know that sometimes under in construction projects, the town gets sued. And we also know that um, there was another case a couple years ago where an abutter's well was, con was potentially contaminated by a construction activity. And that um, resident still doesn't have um, safe drinking water that meets the state standards, but doesn't have the resources to sue um, the contractor. Um, in this particular case, the, um, there is another resident now and several other abutters who are potentially um, impacted by a project, which um, is how we, this was exposed. And we simply were trying to improve the current bylaw so that it would allow the Board of Health to, and the, any involved parties, which whether it's a Conservation Commission, Board of Health, or a Planning Board, to be able to enforce the local regulations to protect the individual property rights, the public health, and the needs of each member of the town. Um, and so that was how it happened. It wasn't intended at all. It was very last minute. And I think it needs to be done uh, quickly because there are uh, there's there's some potential um, problems in town and so that was the reason that the citizens petition was written. Um, all right, before we continue this thread, uh, Marion Neutra has had her hand up for a bit. I'd like to hear what um, what you have to add. Oh, thank you, Steve, and and thanks, Re Rebecca. I want to uh, let you and the other proponents of this know that. 
uh, it, we know that you're coming from a very good place. Everybody shares the concern about our concern about groundwater. And uh, you're absolutely right that any new style of development like cluster developments uh, may have uh, larger sh or clustered septic systems or larger septic systems that uh, are of a size that are not written into the Board of Health regulations. And just a point of fact, um, we worked at, as the planning board, we worked very closely with Board of Health on writing this. I plan. know, yeah, and, I know. And, and that's why this is not at all personal. It's, um, it was- No, 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 I understand. But let, let me identify this problem. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me finish. Uh, and we agreed with, with the Board of Health members that we worked with, and, and you weren't one of them. It was Daryl and David Sawson and Mark that uh, there were uh, potential situations in an open space or cluster subdivision or in any subdivision for that matter that could potentially not be covered by current Board of Health regulations because there's a sort of gap between the regulation for a small shared septic system, and you know this, and the uh, regulations for a standard septic system with lots of uh, lots of space around it. So we agreed at that time, and this was before this bylaw was passed, uh, that the Board of Health regulations would have to be revised in order to deal with this kind of a situation. Uh, the Board of Health agreed on this. And the reason mm. the Board of Health regulations had to be revised was that legally, the planning board was not able to write Board of Health regulations into a zoning bylaw. It's simply not legal to do that. And everything you've said sort of confirms that because what's really need, needed is uh, a review of Board of Health regulations in the view of this open space subdivision bylaw that has a lot of environmental advantages. We'll agree, it's not more houses than would be in a conventional subdivision. And the other thing, the other point of fact I want to bring up is that um, the bylaws are only the first step. Any developer has to get his project through a long series of uh, planning board rules and regulations, in addition to Board of Health rules and regulations. The planning board rules and regs are really they're about, I don't know, what is it, you know, the subdivision regs are probably 20 or 30 pages long. It's very exciting reading. You'll, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> but uh, for a definitive plan to get passed, uh, a developer has to meet all those regulations. And you may not have read them all because to get a definitive subdivision uh, uh, project approved by the planning board requires a groundwater impact assessment. And that is very much like an EHIR. Uh, in fact, we kind of went through the same sorts of things that are in your EHIRs, like you have to uh, do groundwater table elevation estimates, estimates, groundwater flow estimates, and estimates or projections of increases in nutrient and contaminant loading. And these are all just projections because obviously nothing's been built yet. So the last sentence of this, I'll just read it. Projections shall be made in accordance with effluent evaluations specified by the environmental health impact report and other requirements of the board of health regulations. That's because as zoning bylaws, we could not rewrite your uh, Board of Health regulations for you. That has to be done by the Board of Health. And, you know, the planning board would certainly support that, but we cannot write them for you. So uh, th those are the points of fact that I think you have to just take into account here. Yeah, thank you, Marion. Those, those, those were certainly a lot of the same points that I have kind of rattling around in my brain as well. Is that... Um, Rebecca, a lot of what you're saying seems to suggest that the open space bylaw allows developers to somehow bypass um, Board of Health regulations and or uh, 
uh, CONCOM regulations. And my understanding no, is that that's, that's not true. Not, that's so not what I'm trying bit, to say. Okay, well, that, then I must be misunderstanding because you, yes. you've said you've said several times that that um, that you wanted to. Let me see. It's a timing issue. Um, right now, with the the we are in um, a current case brought to our attention that the analysis did not need to be done in advance. So this is simply requiring that the analysis be done at the time of the permitting, which is consistent with state laws and in all 98% of other towns. At this time, it, what happens is when it comes before our board, we say, you know, we would like you to do X, Y, and Z. And then inevitably it just increases cost, it delays progress, and it frust it's frustrating for all the part parties involved. So there, on, in the open space bylaw, it says the, the Board of Health regulations will apply. Uh, that's a quote. All this says is that the timing should be in um, the permitting process rather than after the permitting process. Because no, that's exactly right, Rebecca. And if I can just jump in, if you read through the planning board subdivision rules and regulations, You'll see that it. I means, read every word. <laughs> okay, did you I did read it? Yes. About the the EHIR uh, Board of Health. I mean, th this is all pre-building. This is uh, during the evaluation of the plans by the planning board. I'm just not sure you understood that. Oh no, I did understand it, but it isn't specified, and it, this was just um, to specify that it's part of the permitting because. Of a, uh, of a recent case where um, this was not interpreted as a requirement of the bylaw. And the other is that in a subdivision, if, we if the subdivision was big enough, it would be considered to be a public water supply by the state. But in a subdivision, because setbacks might not be met, if the Board of Health has the authority through the bylaw itself to um, apply the kinds of protections that would be routine uh, and, uh, under a public water supply, it gives the Board of Health some, uh, something to lean on. The, it just needs to be specified in the regulation. That's why it's a very small, um, change in the wording. Um, well, uh, in, in, you mean in the regulations or in the bylaw? We cannot write public health regulations into the zoning bylaw. That's the point I was yeah, trying I, to I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that the planning board can give the Board of Health an authority that the Board of Health doesn't already have. No, no, no. If the, board of, health, if, if the board of Health wants, if you feel like the current Board of Health regulations are inadequate, I, I believe the appropriate way to address it would be to, as, as a member of the Board of Health, bring it up and you alter your own, the, the relevant regulations. I don't, I don't think that adding them into the zoning bylaws is, is, well, I guess as Marion is saying, it's not even legal. Well, no, I'm not sure that's true because we did consult with um, and two attorneys and they thought that this was smart and in keeping with state law and the bylaw has some potential um, potential for um, for things to get far down farther down the road before the evaluations are done in which case it's hard to turn around um, impacts on individuals and protect property rights and public health. So it was um, felt that it would be um, beneficial to uh, slightly alter the wording of the bylaw as written. Um, I don't think that this, that these changes in substance change the open space bylaw. And I also didn't, don't think that the uh, benefit um, 
is addressing something that was, I think it was, uh, it's addressing an unintended consequence of the manner in which it has been drafted. Uh, all right, before we continue, um, there's a Carol with uh, her hand up. Um, did you have something to say? Oh, yep. it's Carol McGarry. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good. Yes, I'm Carol McGarry. I live at 262 Western Avenue. Um, I am on Conservation Commission. I am not speaking for Conservation Commission. I'm speaking as a resident. Um, I, you know, my understanding from having talked to Rebecca and um, and um, just having the understanding of being on Conservation Commission is that the way our our um, regulations work for board and health and for and for concom also to some extent is that but especially for board of health is they're based on setbacks right and they assume a certain size lot size i mean i just had my septic system replaced and you know the engineer said that my well had to be a certain distance from my septic system um so the current regulations that the board of health is operating from are all developed around those and then now we have this cluster housing. And I, if you look at the cluster housing, the wording is, you know, Marion is right. It basically says it's up to the Board of Health to regulate this. The issue that I think this address that is helpful, and if and if as Rebecca has stated that it has passed legal muster, a citizen petition petition does not have access to town council, unlike other board. So, you know, that is one issue, but the advantage of this, I can say from the point of view of being on Conservation Commission is that there are certain circumstances when you're on a regulatory board where you look to the state for guidance and the state provides an authority for your guidance. And so one of the things that I think is beneficial about this is this idea of, of that when it's in cluster housing, it's a public, it's has the same standards as a public water supply that immediately puts in place standards that are known within the state. It, it, I think it's very supportive for the Board of Health to be able to, to have that in place to refer to their known standards. To me, that's probably the biggest benefit of this. And um, it helps, you know, to remove some uncertainty. So I think, you know, there is a question here of legal, you know, does it pass muster legally to present it that way? Certainly that's probably a good idea to, um, to verify that and maybe get a lawyer to, to express, express that. But I just wanted to say that it seems like a good idea to me. Uh, thank you, uh, Dow Beardsley. Okay, first, um, so Daryl Beardsley for Street. The Board of Health has not had any formal uh, knowledge of this um, and hasn't discussed it. So I can't really share any opinions of Board of Health because we have not discussed it at all. And uh, I want to mention that what Marion said was correct, that there were discussions about what might be needed with- uh, Daryl, sorry, your audio is like, it's uh, it's very spotty and it sort of cuts in and out. Do you have a, an, an alternate way of, uh, of mic miking yourself up? Yeah, let me try. Sorry, is this any better? No, not really. No, I really don't have something different. Um, okay. All right, well, I guess continue just sometimes quiet and sometimes loud. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, uh, actually, I can relocate and I'll join from Michael's computer, which might have better. Mine is often a little strange. So uh, you can go on to somebody else and I'll join you in a moment. <laughs> okay, all right, I will, uh, I, will, I will call back on you when you come back, possibly as Michael. Um, Okay, so you had also mentioned that this, you feel a sense of urgency as this is a reaction to some active development proposals and cases. I guess one question I have, which maybe Gino can answer is if you were to alter a zoning bylaw 
in the midst of a development that has already been proposed and is under discussion. Um, do the new zoning bylaws apply to that development or are they grandfathered in under whatever the existing bylaws were at the time that they submitted their, their, their proposal? Um, it, if it's a subdivision uh, and they have submitted a preliminary subdivision plan first, that freezes the zoning and the regulations from the time that 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 those uh, plans were submitted. Okay, so so I guess that goes to the point, Rebecca, that you're making that that the reason why this has been rushed through is because there are existing cases that you feel are exposing a weakness in the in the bylaw. But I guess my point being that if you change it now, it doesn't change anything about those cases. And, right. and, I, yeah. and I feel like it would be preferable to still, again, go through the process of bringing this through the Board of Health and bringing it through the planning board uh, with an eye towards presenting it at next year's town meeting, because if, and I dare say when this likely does not come through, go through at town meeting this year, you would be prevented from bringing it back for two years. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I think that it would, I don't, well, I don't, I, when I, when the citizens petition was written, was submitted, um, it was unclear what the timing of these meetings would be. And I did not know that there wouldn't be an opportunity to talk to the planning board and the board of health prior to this presentation. That was not at all what I had intended or what well, I should say the group of, of signatures um, intended. It was, um, we needed to uh, submit it in time to get it onto the warrant, but we, expected to have the opportunity to discuss it with the authors of the open space bylaw, Mary Neutra, et cetera, and the, the planning board members be, before uh, going to the town meeting. I'm not sure we don't have that time to follow proper procedure um, because it's not that complicated. Um, okay, we've got Michael Lesser, who I believe is probably actually Daryl Beardsley. Yes, Daryl here again. Is this better, I hope? Yes. Excellent. All right, so uh, I'll say that I personally share frustration that Board of Health was not able to make revisions that it anticipated would be needed because of the open space bylaw and to make uh, adjustments for that. It's not that we don't have regulations that cover those, but we foresaw that there might be new, new uh, layouts and, and issues that would arise as a result of them. And lo and behold, the pandemic came along just as we were going to start working on those. And uh, really there hasn't been a spare moment. So. So the, I understand the general intent, I believe, uh, but there is something that you mentioned, Steve, that does concern me as I look at this, is there's a line here, uh, when you mentioned that the language could not be changed. And I'm concerned about where it says subdivisions with more than one residential unit, which cannot meet local setback requirements per existing Sherborne Board of Health regulations will be required to develop pr protections such as those which apply to public water supplies, et cetera. My concern is that we don't permit things that don't meet setback requirements, especially for new construction when it comes to Board of Health. I'm concerned that this might have an unintended consequence of permitting subdivisions that cannot meet local setback requirements. And that worries me. Uh, but again, I haven't had the opportunity to discuss this with Board of Health members or legal counsel. But um, And then I'm also concerned that the following clause will be required to develop protections such 
as those which apply to public water supplies is not specific enough and doesn't identify specific actionable items and the precise references to code sections that apply that fall under mass DEP public water supply regulations. So that would, for me, that would argue for having more time to go over this so that we don't have unintended consequences from this. I look forward to discussing it with you, Daryl, and I was hoping to put it on our agenda um, because I, that is, I believe, the fundamental problem right now with the open space bylaw as written is that it has the, is that we are um, creating cluster zones that will not, it cannot meet the uh, local regulations. And so this was an attempt to uh, minimize those risks. But I don't think it in any way will facilitate um, something that can't meet the regs. I think that it, I think that by definition, none of I, I, any subdivision can't meet the regs because our regulations apply to a single uh, system on a single lot. And anything yeah. more than one um, can't meet the regulations. And that, you know, anyway, we, we, we can have this conversation offline, but this was an intent um, to help the Board of Health to be able to um, uh, state DEP, all the drinking water laws do not apply to private water supplies. Board of Health has a responsibility of enforcing those regulations. And um, as you know, every week, including just last week, we, um, we uh, voted something in that was against the recommendations of the DEP. And so the, these issues are gonna come forward again. And I think it would be beneficial in a subdivision, which by definition, until we have regulations, which I think we're hoping to look to create, um, don't have the ability to uh, create individual protections for the residents and their abutters. And it, what that does is it forces um, legal action. And right now there's a resident who's having to spend a lot of money. Personally, um, there's a, a contractor who's threatening to sue the town. Um, I think that it, if, if some of these protections are in place, it might help to um, prevent unintended consequences and help to protect the interests of everyone, the contractors, the homeowners, and their abutters, and the town overall, the residents, the volunteers, the board members. I guess, Rebecca, I mean, still, I have to go back to my original point, which is that, I, I mean, and I think that Daryl and um, Chris uh, agree that you are, you know, you're coming from a, a place of um, wanting to help and wanting to address what you view as a flaw in the open space um, bylaw. Um, but, but ultimately my, my, my issue is that this is, it's not the appropriate way to address it. And you can't, you can't, you can't submit a citizen's petition as essentially a placeholder because you were um, under a time crunch uh, because you can't, you can't alter it. Um, I suppose in theory, we could have a multiple hours long discussion at the town meeting uh, trying to revise this entire thing. Um, but I would, it's not going to happen. You know, I would, I, number one, I would very strongly encourage you not to do so. And number two, I'm quite certain that, you know, 45 minutes into the discussion, somebody at the town meeting is going to call the vote and then it's going to get voted down. Um, and now you're locked out of this for two years. Um, and again, I would, all I can say is that I would very, very strongly encourage you um, to withdraw it and, and, and bring it to the boards for the, you, you know, between now and town meeting, you can't go through and rewrite your um, petition with the board of health and with the planning board. And I, I, again, having attended enough meetings of both of your um, boards, I, I, I highly doubt that in the number of meetings that you could possibly have between now and the town meeting, um, that the two boards would come up with language that would be agreeable to all parties. Um, and so I, 
I do feel that it's sort of doomed to failure. Um, and I, I don't want, I would rather see this done um, correctly from the ground up as opposed to trying to rush it through. Um, I guess my question to you would be, if, if it were to be that advisory was to vote unanimously no action on this and that the select board was to unanimously vote no action on this and it appears that you don't currently have the support of certainly the planning board and possibly the rest of the board of health would would you still be um, determined to bring this to a town meeting vote where you would require a two-thirds majority this year or would you well, consider I would, I would hope that we would be discussing the merits of the article and because I think that this is I think that right now there are um, some serious uh, risks and omissions in the open space bylaw, not by intent, because everyone was very conscientious and hardworking um, when it was written, but it's definitely um, agreed that some risks are, or some challenges are being introduced. And these measures simply would facilitate our um, bylaw to be consistent with state law in 98% of other towns. It doesn't go beyond anything other than what would be in the best interest of uh, the residents. But certainly, obviously, um, we have to talk about it with the planning board and uh, with my board and certainly the right, hopefully the right decision will be made, but I was presenting it to you tonight to talk, discuss the merits, not um, the procedure, but we can obviously revisit that. I, I mean, I, to my mind, the procedure currently trumps the merits of it. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, our public hearing is coming up in, you know, uh, a little over two weeks. And then the, the, the town meeting is a little over a month away. There's not, there isn't really the time to have the substantive discussion of the merits that this topic warrants, you know, um, uh, and, and I'm, um, you know, it, we're not going to spend hours on this at the town meeting. It's just not going to happen, you know. I mean, again, it's number one, you'll be at the end of the meeting because all the citizens' petitions are, it's going to be late. And some I guarantee you someone's gonna call the vote and it's not gonna, it's not gonna be a two-thirds majority. And so, you know, that's that's why I'm trying not to get too deep into the nitty-gritty of this, because I can already tell you that it's 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 not it's not going to it's not going to pass at the town meeting. Um, and I guess I'm just, I, I, I would, I would, I am, I am asking you if, if you would consider withdrawing this, um, so that it can go through that process, um, which the chair of the planning board has already said that he is happy to have this discussion and to have the planning board be the sponsor of this, um, uh, revision at the next town meeting. Well, I look forward to talking to him and I look forward to talking to um, the planning board as well as the board of health. And I think that the decision should be made after I've had an opportunity to talk to those people. Um, uh, okay, my- uh, But Michael I certainly Lester. would be open to that. Uh, that I think has all along been, uh, I've known that if it isn't, um, it needs to be done properly. And I understand that, but we, this was not intended to be done improperly. So I just hope that I'll have the opportunity to talk to the appropriate boards um, because I do think that this is important and I think that it's something to consider. And I think it will benefit the entire town. Certainly um, in the short term as well as the long run. Um, okay, I've got Daryl slash Michael and then Carol. Okay, so I just wanted to mention one quick little nitty gritty detail. Uh, just in case people think that we don't have regulations that cover subdivisions, we do. It's uh, part three of the Board of Health regulations is for other than a single family home on a single lot. So we do have regulations that cover it. It's just that some of the configurations are getting more creative. Um, 
but they also just pose different environmental challenges that, frankly, not even at the state level are they quite sure how to address some of this. But we've been pioneering before in Sherborne, and we can uh, do so again. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Steve, you've asked a couple times whether the this citizen's petition is going to be withdrawn. And my question to you is somewhat of a procedural one, which is um, I'm curious as to whether a citizen petition, if it were to be withdrawn, that we that has to be said to advisory. Does advisory have some kind of enforcement authority over that? Uh, essentially, uh, what what needs to happen would just be that the, the primary petitioner would need to inform uh, the town moderator, Mary Wolf, and uh, mm -hmm. myself that um, they wish to withdraw the their petition. And then essentially, we just, uh, I would just say that at both the um, public hearing, or if it didn't happen until after the public hearing, then at the town meeting. Um, okay. And uh, that that would be all. The, 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 the petition has to go to the town meeting. It can't be removed from the warrant. Um, so it will be brought up at the town meeting. Um, but then, you know, it, it has happened multiple times in the five years I've been on, on advisory that a petitioner yeah. withdraws. Yeah. So I absolutely. Just yeah, I, just want, I just want to clarify, because I felt you were kind of pressuring Rebecca a little bit. And so it sounds like at any time before town meeting, it can be withdrawn by informing you and the town moderator. Is that right, or is there a um, Yes, I believe it should be any time before town meeting. Um, I don't know the specifics about the because at the public hearing, uh, advisory makes a vote on the uh, on the petition, and advisory will make a write up on it. And so, if it was withdrawn after that, then obviously advisory's write up would would not really be valid anymore. Um, and it's usually it's easier to just simply say that the petitioner has requested that it be withdrawn. But I believe that uh, up to the town meeting, it can be withdrawn. Okay, so you're suggesting that if it's withdrawn, it should happen before the public hearing in two weeks. It would it would make things cleaner, but I don't believe that it would be required. Okay, all right, thanks. Thanks for that clarification. Yep. Um, uh, I guess I would like to open the floor to uh, anybody else from advisory who has any any questions or comments about this? Um, all right, H hearing none. I guess um, I guess where where I'll leave it, Rebecca, is you know again, um, you know take take the next couple of weeks to. Um, uh, officially approach the planning board and to bring it up with the Board of Health for a discussion. Um, uh, but again, just looking at the sort of logistics of what of, of how this is going, I would um, I would ask you to remain very open to the possibility of, of withdrawing it so that the planning board can essentially bring it to the next town meeting, um, which which again, I believe that they are more than willing to have this discussion and uh, work with you and with the Board of Health on um, on a revision. I mean, they've, I believe they've already revised this, uh, this uh, bylaw before. So, um, so again, they, they realize it's a work in progress. And um, I think, I, I think they're, they're more than, I don't want to speak for um, Chris Owen, but I, I think they're more than open to further revisions to it. I would just, I would like to see that that process be followed. Um, Absolutely. Because, Absolutely. because citizens petitions are, I mean, they're, they're very restricted in what you can do with them. Um, and again, it's uh, the town meeting is not going to be the place to have hours and hours of discussion and revisions. Um, you know, you should it's have those all. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll be uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to go over the uh, potential changes with um, everyone involved, and I think they will only enhance the effectiveness of of a bylaw that we thought was a good idea. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> um, all right. Um, finally, we have previous meeting minutes. Let me bring these up. All right, these are the minutes from uh, last week's meeting. Uh, as usual, I'm sorry, this is the first time I'm actually reading them, but if anybody has any corrections they already know of, feel free to call them out to me. Uh, we talked about a lot of stuff last time, didn't we? Um, all right, that all looks good to me. No other amendments from anyone else on advisory. All right, if not, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the Sherburn Advisory Committee meeting of March 2nd, 2022, uh, as shown on screen? I move that we approve the minutes as shown on screen for March 2nd meeting. Second. All right, we'll take a vote. Mark? Aye. Peter? Hi. Dan? Aye. Brendan? Aye. Jane? Aye. Matt? Aye. Wasim? Aye. And I'm also an aye, so the minutes are approved, 8-0. Um, and that should be it. Um, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, let's vote, Mark. Aye. Peter. Aye. Dan. Aye. Brendan. Aye. Jane. Aye. Matt. Aye. Wasim. Aye. Aye. All right, and I'm also an aye, so 928, meeting is adjourned. See you guys same time next week. Thank you all very much. Thank you.